Hello, this is Richard Hammock's Calculus 1 course. We are in part 3 of the course on derivatives. Today, lecture 23a on the chain rule. The chain rule is a new derivative rule that's rather important, so we're going to break it up into two parts. Today, part A, and next time, part B. Lately, we've been coming up with lots of rules that allow us to find derivatives very quickly. For example, if we had the derivative of sine of x times the function x squared plus x, that's the derivative of a product, so we know to use the product rule, which says the answer is going to be the derivative of the first function, the derivative of sine of x is cosine of x, that times the second function, plus the first function sine of x, times the derivative of the second function. And we get the answer in one step. Imagine, though, that instead of multiplying these two functions, sine of x times x squared plus x, we took sine of x squared plus x. We plugged x squared plus x into the function sine. That's no longer a product, so we can't use the product rule for this. In fact, we don't have any rule at all yet to find this derivative, sine of x squared plus x. That's the derivative of a composition, and there's no rule for that yet. So the entire purpose of this lecture today, and the entire purpose of this new rule we'll introduce called the chain rule, is to come up with a rule for the derivative of a composition. So that's our task. But first, let's take a summary of what we know so far. Remember that the derivative of a function f of x is another function, which we denote d dx of f of x, or f prime of x. And f prime of x is the limit as that h approaches 0 of f of x plus h minus f of x over h. You can also write this as the limit as z approaches x of f of z minus f of x over z minus x. And it's equal to, f prime of x is equal to the slope of the tangent to the graph of the function y equals f of x at the point x f of x. So here's our familiar picture, the graph of f of x. You take a point on the graph at x, look at the tangent line. That slope m is f prime of this x. And then we started developing rules that allowed us to find derivatives without using the limit provided we have a function that fits the rules. The derivative of a constant is 0. The derivative of x is 1. The derivative of e to the x is e to the x. The derivative of sine of x is cosine x. The derivative of cosine x is minus sine of x. The derivative of tangent of x is secant squared x. The derivative of cotangent of x is minus cosecant squared x. The derivative of secant x equals secant x tangent x. And the derivative of cosecant x equals negative cosecant x cotangent x. So we had all of these rules for finding derivatives of specific functions. And then we had these rules that are a little more, are a little more general, the rules that have names like the power rule, the derivative of x to the n is n times x to the n minus 1. There's the constant multiple rule, the sum difference rule, the product rule, which we mentioned earlier, and there's a quotient rule. So all of these rules we've seen before. Our purpose today is to come up with this one more rule. It's going to be called the chain rule, and it gives us the derivative of a composition f of g of x. We're going to come up with a new rule for this today. So on that note, let's go back to our motivational example, the same one we looked at earlier on the first page of today's lecture. 
the one we didn't said we didn't have a rule for yet, the derivative of sine of x squared plus x. What is that? If we examine the structure of this function we're taking the derivative of, it's a composition. Sine is like a function f, and you're plugging into that function another function, x squared plus x. Think of that as g of x. So the structure of this problem is we want the derivative of f of g of x. And to do this, we would need, therefore, a rule for ddx of f of g of x. And we don't have one yet. So on this slide, we're going to work out this rule for the derivative of f of g of x, and we're going to call it the chain rule. Now, before we get started, I want to remind you of the definition of f prime of x. And today, we're going to use the second formulation of f prime of x. The limit f prime of x is the limit as z goes to x of f of z minus f of x over z minus x. Now, let's get down to business. We need a rule for ddx of f of g of x. What would it be? Using the def this definition of the derivative, the derivative of f of g of x would be the limit as z goes to x of z plugged into our function that we're differentiating minus x plugged into it over z minus x. And the function is f composed with g. So using this definition of the derivative, we get the limit as z approaches x of z plugged into our function, f of g of z, minus x plugged into our function, which is f of g of x, over z minus x. So there we have used the definition of the derivative to say what the derivative of f of g of x is equal to. Now, of course, that's just the first step. Now we have to work out this limit. On the denominator, the z minus x, it's turning into 0 as z approaches x. So somehow we have to take care of that z minus x on the bottom. To do this, let's break up this fraction here into a product of two fractions. And maybe you wouldn't think of this at first, but after you play around with this uh, limit for a while, you might hit upon this idea. Bring the z minus x in the denominator over into the denominator of a second fraction, and you're going to multiply these two fractions. Now, in order for what we have here to equal what we have on the top, what's on the numerator here has to be equal to what's on the denominator there. So those will cancel out and give you the previous line. What we're going to put in the numerator and denominator here and here is the quantity g of z minus g of x. Here and here. So those guys cancel out and give you what you had before. Now, why would we do that? Well, one reason is if you peek ahead and look at the limit as z approaches x of this part right here, g of z minus g of x over z minus x, that's just the definition of g prime of x. So the definition of a derivative is changing this part into g prime of x, which is good. Um, we just really have to work on what's happening here. In this fraction, allow me to put the g of z's in an orange box and the two g of x's in a blue box. And I'm doing this to highlight a certain structure that's happening here that's going to help us with this limit. Go back to the definition of f prime of x. Let me put all the x's in blue boxes and all the z's in orange boxes. And now if we just get rid of the letters, you could read this definition of derivative f prime as f prime of blue equals the limit as orange approaches blue of f of orange minus f of blue 
divided by orange minus blue, where orange and blue could represent any quantities that you want, not just x and z, but anything. But this rule would tell you what f prime of blue is. Look at what's happening now in this limit. z is approaching x. So as z approaches x, assuming g is continuous, g of z is getting closer and closer to g of x. So in other words, orange is approaching blue. So in this limit, we have the limit as orange approaches blue of f of orange minus f of blue over orange minus blue. We have the limit as orange approaches blue of f of orange minus f of blue over orange minus blue, and that's f, of f prime of blue. So this entire limit right here is f prime of the blue, and the blue is g of x. So f prime of g of x. And then this other part over here, we said that that is the limit as z approaches x of g of z minus g of x over z minus x. That's g prime of x. So there we go. This is a quick verification of our latest rule. We've just figured out that the derivative of f of g of x is f prime of g of x times g prime of x. Let's summarize that in our conclusion. It answers the question we had here, what is the derivative of f of g of x? We've just figured out that the derivative of f of g of x is f prime of x, g of x times g prime of x. Now, if you look at it a little more closely, this derivation that we did here, it's kind of a quick and dirty derivation for the derivative of f of g of x. If um, you examine it a little more closely, there's a couple of details that you'll need to resolve, um, but what we've done here is the basic picture. I hope it convinces you that the derivative of f of g of x is f prime of g of x times g prime of x. Again, we've just determined that the derivative of f of g of x is f prime with g of x plugged into it times g prime of x. Before we put this in a box and call it the chain rule, I want to address another way of looking at this derivative. Suppose we have y equals f of g of x. So in other words, y is the function that we're differentiating up here. Then you can break this up into two pieces. If y is equal to f of g of x, you could say, well, y is equal to f of u, where this u that's being plugged in to the f, that's equal to g of x. So u is equal to g of x. We could break this composition up into two separate equations, y is equal to f of u, where in turn, u is equal to g of x. And I want to follow the consequences of our conclusion here in light of this breaking up. Our conclusion up here says that the derivative of f of g of x is f prime of g of x times g prime of x. And this g of x that's being plugged into the f prime, now we've got that as equal to u. So this product here would be f prime of u times g prime of x. The derivative of f of g of x since y is equal to f of g of x, we could denote that as dy dx. And let's look at this other right-hand side. You have a product of two derivatives. Look at the first one, f prime of u. y is equal to f of u here, so f prime of u would be the derivative of y equals f of u, which you could write as dy du. So f prime of u is dy du, the derivative of this function. 
and it's being multiplied by g prime of x. And g prime of x is the derivative of u equals g of x, in other words, du dx. So what we're saying here is that another way of looking at the chain rule is to say whenever you have y equals f of g of x and you break it up this way, the derivative dy dx is equal to the product of two derivatives dy du times du dx. And that's really nice notation because if you think about these symbols for d derivatives dy du and du dx as being fractions, then the du's would cancel and you'd get dy dx equals dy dx. So it's a, it's a nice mnemonic for remembering the chain rule. So having said all of that, let's write down exactly what this chain rule is. On this slide, we have two ways of looking at our new rule, the chain rule. We'll call the first one version one, the one that we have up here. It says the derivative of f of g of x is f prime with g of x plugged into it times g prime of x. In our second version, we could write it this way, the way we did here. If y is equal to f of g of x, then y is equal to f of u, as we had up here, and u is equal to g of x. So dy dx equals dy du times du dx dy dx equals dy du times du dx. These two versions of the chain rule look a little different, but they say exactly the same thing. And we're going to look at some examples of applying the chain rule, and we'll work out version 1 and version 2 of each of our problems today. And you get to decide which one you want to use for any individual problem. I think you'll find that sometimes one will be more convenient than the other. And by working a lot of examples, you'll get a feel for when to use one or the other. So here's our chain rule again, restated up at the top. And as our first example, let's go back to that motivational problem that started this whole discussion. Let's find the derivative of sine of x squared plus x, the derivative of this composition. And we'll start off with version 1 of the chain rule. We're looking for the derivative of sine of x squared plus x. And this is the derivative of a composition, f of g of x, where f is the function sine and g of x is the function x squared plus x. We're finding the derivative of a composition here, and that's exactly what the chain rule tells us how to do. It says the derivative of f of g of x is f prime of g of x times g prime of x. So let's write that down here. And now let's translate that back up into the functions that we have in our actual example. f is the function sine, so f prime would be cosine, the derivative of sine. g of x is being plugged into that function, and our g of x in this example is x squared plus x. So we plug in x squared plus x into our cosine function. And now we're multiplying by g prime of x. Now remember, g of x is the function x squared plus x, so g prime of x is going to be 2x plus 1. And there's our answer. The derivative of sine of x squared plus x is cosine of x squared plus x. Whole thing times the function 2x plus 1. So we pretty much got that in one step. What about version 2 of the same problem? Well, in version 2, we would say that y is the function sine of x squared plus x. That's the function we want to find the derivative of. And we can break this up into two separate equations. 
it's y equals sine of u, where this u is x squared plus x. So break this sine of x squared plus x into y equals sine of u, where in turn u equals x squared plus x, and we're here. And version 2 of the chain rule tells us what the derivative dy dx is going to be. dy dx is dy du times du dx. And let's work this out. First of all, dy du. That's the derivative of y equals sine of u. Well, what's the derivative of sine of u? It's cosine of u. So dy du is cosine of u. Now we're multiplying that times du dx. Du dx would be the derivative of u equals x squared plus x, which is 2x plus 1. So here's our product, dy du times du dx. Now we're not quite done yet because we've got two variables, x and u, in this answer. We started out with all x's, so we need to end up with all x's. How do we fix that? Well, here, this u that's right here, remember u is equal to x squared plus x. So this term is cosine of x squared plus x. So we get, as our an answer, cosine of x squared plus x times 2x plus 1. And you'll see here that that's exactly what we got using version 1 of the chain rule. So let's look at another example. Let's find the derivative of tangent of 1 over x. Tangent of 1 over x is a composition. So if you're looking for the derivative, you're going to have to use the chain rule, which tells us what the derivative of a composition is. The derivative of f of g of x equals the derivative of the outside function f with the inside function g of x plugged into it, whole thing multiplied by the derivative of this inside function. So we're about to do that with f of g of x, where f is the outside function tangent, and g of x is the inside function 1 over x. But before doing, since we know we're going to differentiate that 1 over x, let's write this function as tangent of x to the power of minus 1, so we'll be able to exploit the, the power rule in part of our work. Okay, so version 1 of the chain rule. We're going to apply this formula to the derivative of tangent of x to the power of minus 1. This is the derivative of an outside function tangent of an inside function x to the minus 1. And version 1 of the chain rule says the first thing you want to do is find the derivative of your outside function, which would be the derivative of tangent, which we know is secant squared by a familiar derivative rule. And then into this derivative secant squared, you plug in your inside function g of x, which is x to the power of minus 1. And after that, you multiply by the, the derivative of that inside function, the derivative of x to the power of minus 1, which by the power rule is minus x to the power of minus 1 minus 1, or minus x to the power of minus 2. Now, cleaning that up, bring the minus out front. x to the minus 2 comes down as an x squared. And we, on top, we have secant squared of 1 over x. So our answer is in the box. The function is, the derivative is, minus secant squared 1 over x. Whole thing divided by x squared. So there we go. We've got the derivative. We pretty much got it in one step. And then we had a cleanup step as well. Let's look at version 2. Let's find the derivative of tangent of x to the power of minus 1 with version 2 of the chain rule. Well, we have the function y equals tangent of x to the power of minus 1, and we want to find its derivative. And version 2 says 
break that composition up into two equations. First of all, y equals tangent of a u, where that u would be x to the power of minus 1. And then the derivative dy dx, according to version 2 of the chain rule, equals dy du times du dx, the product of the derivatives of these two functions. So working this out, dy du is the derivative of tangent of u, that's secant squared u, and then the du dx, that's the derivative of u equals x to the power of minus 1, that's minus x to the power of minus 2. But we're not done yet. When you're applying version 2, you're going to always end up with a step here where you have two variables. You've got secant squared u, and you want to convert this u to an x because the function had an independent variable of x, so its derivative better have an independent variable of x, not a u. Just remember that u up here is equal to x to the power of minus 1. So we have secant squared of x to the power of minus 1 times minus x to the power of minus 2. And then cleaning that up, bringing the negative out and so on, and the power of minus 2 down to the bottom, we get exactly the same answer that we got with version 1. So two versions of the chain rule, they give us the same derivative, of course. Let's do another example. This time we want to define the derivative of secant of the square root of x. And as before, let's write that square root of x as a power because you're expecting maybe somewhere in here to have to use a power rule. But first and foremost, we want to find the derivative of secant of the function x to the power of 1 half. And that's a composition so we're going to have to use the chain rule to find this derivative because the chain rule tells us how to find the derivative of a composition. Let's apply version 1 of the chain rule. We want the derivative of secant of x to the 1 half. So the chain rule says to find the derivative of that composition, first of all take the derivative of your outside function which in this case would be the derivative of secant. Now we know that the derivative of secant is secant times tangent by one of our now familiar derivative rules. So that's our f prime, the derivative of the outside function. And into it, we have to plug in a g of x. We have to plug in the inside function, which is x to the 1 half. And notice there are two places in this derivative that that needs to be plugged into, here and here, into the secant and into the tangent. So we put it in in both places. So right here is our f prime of g of x, this part. And now we have to multiply by g prime of x, the derivative of the inside function, which according to the power rule would be 1 half x to the power of 1 half minus 1, or 1 half x to the power of negative 1 half. And that's our answer. We got it in one step. Maybe there's a little bit of cleanup here to do. Um, let's convert back to radicals. x to the power of minus 1 half comes down to the bottom as a x to the power of 1 half, which is square root of x, multiplied by the 2. So on the denominator, you have 2 square root of x. On the numerator, secant square root of x times tangent square root of x. So there's our answer. One step in version 1. Let's apply version 2. So in version 2, we have the function y equals secant of x to the 1 half, and we want to find its derivative. So version 2 says you break up this composition into two equations. First of all, y equals secant of u, where that u would be x to the power of 1 half. And in so doing, 
The punchline is that dy dx, the derivative you want, is the product of the derivative dy du with the derivative du dx. So we write that down. And the problem now becomes computing these two derivatives. First of all, dy du, well, let's see. y is equal to secant u. So by a familiar derivative rule, dy du is going to be secant u times tangent u. So there we go. And that's got to be multiplied by du dx. u is equal to x to the 1 half, so du dx is the derivative of that. It's 1 half u to the power of minus 1. So here we have our dy du times du dx. But we're not quite done yet because we have two variables, u and also x. It should be all x. That's what we started with. So what do we do? Remember that u is equal to x to the 1 half. So these two u's here, they would change into x to the 1 halves, there and there. And we're right where we were here, cleaning that up. We get secant squared of x tangent squared of x over 2 square root of x. So again, we used two versions of the chain rule to find the derivative of this function. And of course, we got the same answer. Let's do one final example. And in this example, I want to illustrate an important point. Sometimes you will have not the composition of two functions, f and g, but a composition of three functions. For example, you might have y equals f of g of h of x. That's a three-tiered composition, and you might want to find the derivative of that, and the chain rule allows you to find that derivative as well. And it plays out like this. When you have a composition of, say, three functions, f of g of h of x, you can write that as three equations where y is equal to f of u, it's f of something, so just call what's being plugged into f u, and then what is u? It's g of something, so let's call this something h of x a z, so u is equal to g of z, where that thing z plugged into g is h of x, so z equals h of x. So a composition of three functions can be written or broken down as three equations as expressed here. And the chain rule plays out this way. The derivative of this f of g of h of x, dy dx, equals the product of the derivatives of these three functions, dy du, that's the derivative of the first function, times du dz, the derivative of the second function, times dz dx, the derivative of the third function. So let's do an example of this. Let's differentiate the function y equals tangent of sine of x squared. And notice that's an f of g of h of x. It's a composition of three functions. So if we want to find the, chain, the uh, derivative, we're using the chain rule. Let's start off with version 1. Version 1 says we're looking for the derivative of tangent of sine of x squared. That's a composition. It's the function sine of x squared plugged into tangent. And version 1 tells us how to do that. It says take the derivative of the outside function, plug in the inside function, multiplied by the derivative of the inside function. So first of all, we take the derivative of the outside function, tangent, and that's secant squared. We plug in the inside function, which is sine of x squared, and then we multiply by the derivative of that inside function. And let me write that as, this is our g prime of x, let me write that as d dx of sine of x squared. So this, in one step, we apply the chain rule to the composition tangent 
of sine of x squared. And we got this, but we're not done yet because we still need to find the derivative of sine of x squared. Looking at sine of x squared, that's a composition. So to find its derivative, we've got to use the chain rule again. So the answer we're going to get is this. First of all, let's write our secant of sine of x squared here. And we're multiplying by the derivative of sine of x squared. And we've got to use the chain rule to find that derivative. Chain rule says take the derivative of your outside function, which is cosine. Plug in your inside function, which is x squared. And then multiply by the derivative of your inside function, which is 2x. So there we go. We've just found the derivative of tangent of sine of x squared. And it's secant squared of sine of x squared, cosine of x squared times 2x. So notice how we had to kind of chain through the chain rule. We, that's why it's called the chain rule. You applied it once, and it involved a problem here that was another chain rule problem before you get your final answer. Let's do version two of the same problem. We have y equals tangent of sine of x squared from up here, and we want to find its derivative. So in version two of the chain rule, we know to break that up into a product of our, our uh, break that up into three functions. First of all, y equals tangent of u, where u is equal to sine of x squared. Let's call that u equals sine of z, where z is what's being plugged into the sine. That's x squared. So z equals x squared. So here we've broken our composition of three functions up into three separate equations, as indicated up here in the statement of the chain rule. So we're looking for dy dx, and the chain rule tells us that dy dx is going to be the derivative dy du, that's the derivative of this first function, times du dz, the derivative of the second function, times dz dx, which is the derivative of the third function. Carrying that out, first of all, dy du is the derivative of y equals tangent of u, that's secant squared u. Then we have du dz, that's the derivative of u equals sine of z, that would be cosine of z. And finally, dz dx, that's the derivative of z equals x squared, that's 2x. Now notice at this point we have three variables, a u, a z, and an x. And we started out just with one variable in the problem, an x, so we need to get everything in terms of an x. First of all, let's see, the u that's right here inside the secant squared, well, u is equal to sine of z. So this first term is secant squared sine of z. That's being multiplied by cosine of z. And remember that z is equal to x squared, so that cosine of z is cosine of x squared, and then times the 2x. So now we've knocked out the, the z here, but we picked up a sine of z there, because u is equal to sine of z. So finally, to get rid of that z, again, z is equal to x squared. So changing that to an x squared gives us an answer of secant squared sine of x squared times the function cosine of x squared times the function 2 times x. So there we go. We got the derivative of this function in two different ways, by version 1 of the chain rule and version 2 of the chain rule. So you should get lots of practice. For each problem you work, try version 1 and then try version 2. You may have a preference. I kind of like version 1 because it tends to be a lot less writing. And 
I have a feeling that you're going to like version 1 too. I think most of the problems you do, you'll ultimately be using version 1. However, there are times, there will be times where version 2 is actually more convenient. So it's good to be fluent in both of these. So that's it for today. We're not quite done with the chain rule because there are lots more examples we need to look at and a few ideas we need to talk about. So we're going to break this up into two lectures. Today was lecture 23A. Next time, lecture 23B, more examples. And I want you to work some exercises too to get really good at this. Have a great week, and I'll see you next time. Goodbye.